This is episode 194 of the Rio Grande Foundation's Tipping Point New Mexico podcast. I'm Paul Guessing. And I'm Wally Drangmeister. I'm president of the Rio Grande Foundation, New Mexico's free market think tank. You can find out more about the foundation at riograndefoundation.org. Well, Wally, we finally have some movement out of the uh, Lujan Grisham administration on economic policy or talking about it a little bit behind closed doors and off the record, of course. Uh, <laughs> out, of, uh, out of earshot of the Open Meetings Act, evidently. Yeah, well, we'll certainly find mm-hmm. out about that. Uh, but the uh, Economic Advisory Council, as it's being called, has been named. Uh, you can find out for yourself all the various folks at NewMexico.gov who have been named to that particular body, 15 members on the council. Um, you know, some names that a lot of us know, uh, Brian Moore, former state legislator from Clayton, and uh, uh, he was in the Martinez administration, so a Republican, uh, works as a lobbyist for the New Mexico Association of Counties. Uh, so somebody I saw quite a bit this legislative session, which seems like an eternity ago, uh, I don't know, Wally, do you know any of the other folks on the list? The only other person that I know, well, I know Jason Sandell. He, yes. Uh, he's prominent uh, Democrat oil and gas guy from the Four Corners, Aztec Well, uh, family of companies. So up there up there at Aztec, New Mexico. Uh, Carrie Phils, uh, I knew her a little bit. And uh, really, that's about it. So uh, before we get into the logistics of this group, any other names stick out at you or, uh, you know, any of these folks? No, I, I was like you, you know, I knew Jason. I knew I'd heard many of the names didn't have uh, close relationships. And, uh, these, uh, these sort of, uh, panels either are extremely powerful and extremely influential or else they rise to the level of the sixties and seventies blue ribbon commission that, They're just there for political cover. And I'm not really sure which of these uh, two it actually is, whether they really have influence or is it just a relief valve for the administration has decided what they want to do, which, uh, you know, that, uh, you know, so that's, that's the whole thing. Uh, There's economies are complex things and, you know, it's hard to expect, uh, you know, a number of people to be able to have intimate knowledge about everything in the, the Mm -hmm. economy. You know, one of the things about, being in a capitalist form of uh, of an economy is that the uh, the business owners and the the uh, customers get to make these decisions. It's amazing how good a job they do. Uh, this is one of those that's kind of trying to take command and control, and then bring some semblance of knowledge of the economy to opening up. And you know, we'll see how that goes. Yeah, and you know, just a few points kind of off the top of my head. Uh, although not really. I mean, I've thought extensively about this group and its existence. The fact that it took over a month and a half, basically, to get it in place. You know, the, the economy should have been a immediate second thought to the governor as she started to work on the virus itself. Once we kind of had a grasp on the danger or how much of an issue it was going to be, uh, the economy should have been a focal point, and if she couldn't handle it herself, name an advisory panel to consider options for what to do about the economy. The transparency issue is huge, not just the fact that their meetings are off the record, and really limited information will be available in terms of what, if anything, they say to her and advise her on, but the ability to reach out to these people is non-existent. You go to newmexico.gov, and there is no contact information not just for the individuals on the committee but the committee as a whole you can't send them a note yeah uh it's just baffling uh and i hate to say it but you know we've criticized the governor on this in a variety of issues but uh this is the politicians doing top-down approaches especially to the economy uh which is the antithesis of what we at the Rio Grande Foundation believe in when what we need is a lot more bottom-up innovation and different approaches there. Uh, So I'm skeptical about what these folks are going to do. We don't know what exact role they'll have. We do know that 
there's a hospital administrator on the board. Uh, we know that construction is represented. We know that the film industry is represented, and they're uh, one of they're the most notable recipient of government largesse in the way of tax dollars. That's NBC Universal, which is in many ways a two-time champion, if you will, in terms of re- receiving tax dollars because they got LIDA funds for their studio in Albuquerque in addition to the massive film subsidies that are provided every single year. Uh, a, a piker relative to them is uh, Pete Trevisani. Uh, he's the CEO of the New Mexico United, which got four million bucks or so for a new stadium. Now, one wonders, uh, given the proclivity of politicians to pull back unspent capital outlay dollars in times of economic crisis, whether uh, some of that money will be coming back and what what could possibly be done. And, you know, is this the time to be spending tax dollars on professional sports franchises? We'll see, but he's got to see the the table, at least uh, uh, seemingly very well-connected, intimate table, uh, you've got agriculture there. You've got a banker there. You've got Jason Sandell, as I mentioned, the head of the uh, hotel in Las Vegas, New Mexico. The historic Plaza Hotel uh, is on there. Alan Affelt, uh, Risk Sense uh, company here in Albuquerque, XTO Energy. So a different oil and gas voice. Southeast yeah, so they have the North e- uh, Northwest, Southeast uh, oil and gas representation. So Which that's is right, great. considering yeah. the, the impact of that industry and the very, very different situations in those two basins. Yeah, absolutely. They, they, uh, they have as much difference between those two corners of the state as a lot of times an oil industry does in a completely another country. So Yeah. Uh, AFL-CIO, so big labor, uh, labor, whatever you want to call them, is represented... Uh, Pueblo, uh, Carrie Phyllis is a uh, nightclub and uh, restaurant owner, and then you have renewable energy on board as well. So, you know, it's not a surprising group in the sense that that is uh, the kind of, uh, those are some of the core interest groups of the governor and her uh, inner circle, people who have influenced her so far in this uh, time that she's been in office. Uh, we'll see, though. Uh, we don't know what these people's real role is going to be. Will they influence things, or will they just uh, kind of be uh, a sounding board for the governor or uh, just pushed aside? Is it all uh, dressing, window dressing? So I, I don't know. Yeah, and an analogy, you know, they have uh, transition teams that form when there's a new governor that comes into place, and uh, – you know, my perspective on those, I've never served on one, uh, I think, blessedly. But uh, f- I've known uh, literally dozens of people who have. And it always seems like there's a little more smoke than there is fire in these sorts of things. That, uh, yeah, there may be some information that flows, but not maybe as much. And then the also, the, the amount of time between the timing of when this group was named and when announcements were made with regard to policy things, uh, it just seemed like, yeah, not that this group does not have a role, but I think that the uh, the administration had um, maybe largely decided many of these issues before this group was even announced. Because like you say, it's not like they've been in place for the last couple of months uh, deliberating extensively during this uh, shutdown period that we were experiencing. Yeah, and kind of broadly speaking, uh, of course, this body was named last week. Then they were, uh, the governor did pull back on some of her most stringent re- restrictions on various economic activities. And uh, we, we can certainly talk about where that went. Uh, for starters, uh, Rio Grande Foundation back in mid-April put out a blog posting that got incredible uh, traffic, a lot of interest, a lot of shares and reshares on social media. And it dealt with eight things that the governor should immediately reopen in New Mexico's economy. I'm not going to take credit for the governor's action because uh, a lot of these were just very common sense oriented things. Golf courses being one of the most notably and debated issues, uh, state parks. Now I haven't heard yet. uh, First and foremost, a lot of state parks are, are water, uh, you can easily socially isolate in those kinds of areas. 
Have you heard any updates about Elephant Butte? Because I, you know, I have not. So you hear a lot about what's going on on the beach in California and what's going on in the lakes around Austin, Texas, but nothing about Elephant Butte. So. Because that was one of the ones that's been still closed despite yeah. the governor's loosening restrictions. And of course, that's near you know Tier C, southern central part of the state, right. uh, not up near the Four Corners, like Navajo Lake, uh, which is up in the Four Corners different situation i can understand why that might not be open because it is worth noting that the governor did not open uh every area of the state equally and this is something that to be fair we have and uh folks on our general side the reopen side have been saying don't treat every area of the state exactly the same so we have areas that are reopening including right here albuquerque bernalillo county but you have Gallup and a complete and total lockdown situation right, right. now. And you have uh, the Four Corners, San Juan County, which is uh, not quite to that level. But golf courses are not opening in San Juan County. I've talked to folks up there over the right. weekend. And, uh, you know, medical facilities. It wasn't in her original uh, announcement Thursday afternoon. But uh, medical facilities are under restrictions but allowed to now uh, offer elective and outpatient medical procedures, which is another part of our eight-point plan. So we've got state parks, golf courses, medical procedures. Nurseries still remain kind of curbside, still outside of the, the big box store regulation where they're allowed to basically open. Gun stores were allowed to open. Liquor stores remain basically closed. Uh, there's been no... Yeah, you can't do... Of, yeah, yeah. Um. And uh, I believe the announcement I listened uh, uh, to part of the broadcast was uh, curbside service for these businesses if it's allowed under your permit. Well, curbside service looks probably a lot like drive through liquor sales, which uh, New Mexico got rid of many years ago. So I think maybe not that. But, you know, there's states around uh, the country that have allowed restaurants to deliver wine and mixed drinks uh, with food, uh, new, you know. But liquor stores were open for a significant part of the early portion of this yeah, and then situation the, to begin with, with very little restrictions, nothing that you wouldn't have found at the local Walmart. Yeah, so. exactly. So, so, no, it's, it's, it is interesting. And, you know, first of all, the fact that a state as diverse as New Mexico to have uh, different policies for different parts of the state, I applaud that as a general, as a general idea. Uh, Harding County with, uh, you will not have 500 uh, COVID deaths in Harding because I think there's not 500 people in the county. So it's one of those, it's different in different places. And sure. so, yeah, and it is, uh, it is a little bit disturbing what's going on in, you know, in Gallup in McKinley County. Uh, don't know, have any really personal insight in that, any ideas, but the fact that there's something going on there to deal with that differently than, than the rest, uh, but this whole idea about getting the economy at least going again, particularly in the small business uh, sector, because that's the sector that was uh, hurt the worst by the close down. Again, your Walmarts and Targets and big box stores, uh, because uh, your Lowe's, uh, you know, Home Depot, they were in the construction industry, quote unquote. But, you know, the little store that just sold products, they were left out. And yep. it's very interesting how that happened. And I have a feeling there's some uh, business owners that are very pleased to be at least dealt with uh, on a little bit better basis, you know, come this first part of May and hopefully even better uh, in the middle of May. Yeah, and uh, last point, churches uh, remain closed still, which is interesting that she hasn't given them more of a blessing, so to speak, to <laughs> open up, not to be too punny. That Pun way. intended. Yeah. Uh, and you mentioned uh, treating different areas differently. And, of course, you know Gallup in particular. My understanding is that Gallup's economy, Gallup as a, as a place uh, in McKinley County uh, you know, is a big county, but Gallup is kind of the urban center there. There's a lot of traffic into that area from the Navajo Reservation, which has, of course, been decimated. You know, yeah. very uh, sad what's happening there with the uh, COVID-19 outbreak. And you know, there's just been uh, a lot of it in Gallup. Now, uh, how long that whole situation lasts uh, with the shutdown? Uh, and she has the authority. I went and looked up the state law and... Uh, 
you know, maybe there's something to be said for uh, doing uh, some reevaluation of New Mexico's laws in the in the future when it comes to how we allow power to go to one person in a emergency situation. But if you go to the uh, New Mexico legal code in in the uh, Hazard Emergency Management Act, uh, section 12-10-17, proclamation of emergency. Upon request of the mayor, remember the the mayor. Yeah, the mayor had asked the governor. Asked the governor. Yeah, and the outgoing and the incoming both asked for the same thing. And I don't, yeah, but it wasn't readily apparent to people who aren't familiar with the law why they would specifically request it. Well, that was a legal procedure. So upon the request, the uh, governor can find that a public disorder, disaster, or emergency which affects life, there you go, or property exists in the state. The governor may proclaim a state emergency in the area affected. Proclamation becomes effective immediately upon its signing by the governor. Uh, but the, pub- the governor shall give public notice of its contents through the public press and other news media. So, a uh, very broad authority for the governor to act uh, in a crisis dealing with the life, uh, you know, people in that community. Because, you know, it's often called the Riot Act or the, uh, uh, there, it had to do with riots. Uh, and, you know, you might be misled into believing that, well, this law is being misapplied right. to a riot when there was clearly no riot in Gallup, New Mexico. Uh, but it's not really just about riots. It's obviously a broader law than that. Yeah, and uh, Paul, one of the, when I, so many years ago, uh, I worked with you on a little project. It was the one of the first times I'd ever uh, done anything with you. Um, we worked on that project about arcane laws that are still on the books. And I won't call this quote unquote riot act one of those that rises to that level, you know, but there are laws that get put into place that kind of linger there. They're like the sleeper cells of bad policy, if you will, where they're there and people are like, well, we don't need to deal with those because nothing would ever happen that that would come into play. But, you know, there's a lot of things, and this is a good example. Uh, I don't think anyone has considered this. I've not heard any talk of it in my entire uh, career of going up to Santa Fe for some 20 years. And there are a lot of things on the books like that. So uh, it's one of those I'm not uh, saying today is the time or place to do this. But, you know, maybe a, a little housekeeping, housekeeping in the, uh, the legal code and the law, laws and statutes of the state of New Mexico. And it, or at least looking at these from a policy point of view would be something well advised here in the not too distant future. Yeah, I think that's an excellent point. And there are a lot of little rules and laws on the books. One of the ones that kind of amused us, and uh, you're right, that was a uh, (laughs) project that I did. One of the first, very first things I did at the Rio Grande Foundation was a uh, stupid laws, essentially. Yeah, and we had like wanted posters. Give us the stupidest law. And they, uh, a a few years ago, the legislature removed, uh, there's a, there was a prohibition on idiots uh, right. described in law voting in elections and, uh, they changed that. And so right. I, uh, I had some fun with that. <laughs> Let's just put it that way because, uh, I think idiots have been voting in New Mexico elections for <laughs> quite a very long time. And, uh, uh, no legal prohibition has kept that situation from uh, unfolding. But well, you know, and as funny as that one is, Paul, that's a good example of something about the term idiot had a, a legal standing mm-hmm. at some point. Well, the whole system doesn't even, that term, you know, I, I bet money if you look in the, uh, what is it, the class four or five, whatever, the uh, the manual they use to diagnose mental conditions, that word doesn't even appear in there would be my suspicion. And so then what do you do with that as a law point of view? So Yeah, and I, I wouldn't go so far as to say that the governor has clearly violated the spirit of the law, let alone the letter of the law. She's, I don't think, violated the letter of the law uh, on any of her uh, efforts here. But I do think it is an open question as to whether we want any governor of any political party to have such broad control. Uh, Because, you know, 
there is a riot. There is a literal physical danger. And I think a lot of these laws growing out of the 70s and uh, uh, very unstable times, they... You know, riots... They, Outside of UNM, uh, Wells Park, as I recall, yeah. you know, there was a lot of things going on in the 60s and 70s that really concerned people in New Mexico. Yeah, should we maybe more narrowly uh, construe some of these laws based on potential for future pandemics? Now, we hope that there's not a pandemic for a very long time, another hundred years, I guess, exactly. uh, long after you and I are, are gone away. But uh, you never know, and it doesn't hurt to consider tightening up uh, some of these laws and making sure that, you know, for example, that there is a drop dead uh, time and another bad, bad <laughs> turn of phrase, but there is a, there is a time in which the governor has to either uh, give up her new authority or um, her emergency authority or go to the legislature and have a case made for some, something done, you know, et cetera, et cetera. There, there's at least got to be conversations about those kinds of things. But that's after the whole situation is in the book. Exactly. Uh, one quick note, and uh, we talked about the Recovery Council, but, uh, you know, it, it's like reading the tea leaves out of the, uh, the, the Soviet Union or the, the Vatican when they come up with a new pope in, yes. in terms of the governor and her economic uh policies and we talked about that but the, the santa fe new mexican had a very interesting article by jean good uh, on april 29th and it's the first i think realistic discussion i've seen in any media outlet about what could be on the chopping block in as a result of this economic shutdown slowdown downturn whatever it might be uh, of course, that's Santa Fe, New Mexican, April 29th. It's uh, high-profile budget items could be cut amid New Mexico's economic downturn. Now, you know, it talks about right off the bat, the early childhood trust fund, $320 million. Right. I think that one's a no-brainer. Right. Uh, it's one that we didn't think much of at the beginning. Uh, pension reform now. Uh, there was going to be money spent now in order to make the pension system more solvent. And, you know, not to put too fine of a point on it, folks, but uh, when it came to the pension system of New Mexico, you traditionally, going back 20 or 30 years, had very high interest rates. And interest rates are easy because you you get them just by falling off the boat, so to speak. The right. turnip truck, truck, you're right there, and interest rates, you know, 10, 12, whatever percent, you can get a great rate of return for your investors just through the interest rates. It's been a lot tougher in recent years with the stock market relying on that. Well, and because those same interest rates, as you alluded to, they're down in the one, two, three, four percent yeah. range. And to get in that upper range of uh, debt, you know, oriented interest rates, you need to take on a lot of risks, sometimes as much, and some would argue maybe more than certain parts of the stock market. So, yeah. uh, no, thanks for that. Yeah, because interest rates, as we know, are very, very low. Uh, many, many nations have 0% or below interest rates on the books. And the point about the pension reform is that this crisis now, stock market has held up to date far better than I think most people would have expected. Uh, so it hasn't been quite the disaster that you might have expected given the carnage throughout the rest of the economy. But that is a precarious place, I believe, for the stock market to be and for you to be investing, or, or not you individually, but pension systems to be investing large quantities of their, their money. So my point is, is that the pension reform that passed this session is even more critical. So if there is a spending item from the last two years that should be kept in place, it's probably the 70 or so million dollars that are going to be brought to bear to uh, start the pension reform. Uh, there's capital outlay projects, and uh, this is all from the article again. Pay raises, of course. Interesting to note, uh, and, and again, hate to beat the dead horse, but who is quoted in this article in the New Mexican? Well, Patty Lundstrom, a Democratic state representative. Steve Neville, a Republican state uh, senator from the Four Corners. And John Arthur Smith. You get absolutely zero from the administration, you get no comments except for, well, she 
this was a priority for the governors or this was something that the governor right. put forth. They have nothing in this article from the Lujan Grisham administration. Yes, yeah, so yeah, we have seen, which is, uh, it's interesting. A colleague of mine used to say, it's amazing how in people sometimes their biggest strength is their biggest weakness. Well, uh, the governor's policy decision to focus on COVID really as, if not the only thing, the overwhelming majority of her time, uh, she's gotten good polling for that, as a matter of fact. And so there are a lot of people that are, are happy with that. But that can also turn because there are other things, and we're starting to see them now with uh, the economy needing to go back up. We're starting to see impacts. Uh, and it's interesting the uh, impacts aren't felt in New Mexico until it starts to impact the government. You know, it's been the small business owners in uh, Albuquerque and across New Mexico that have felt the brunt of this. Well, they're starting to do furloughs and layoffs and other things in uh, municipal governments around the state, and now it starts to get the broader uh, attention of the population and even the media. Yeah, no doubt about it. Um, while the governor has... Had uh, the one poll that I've seen is relatively positive, although some governors across the country have incredibly positive poll numbers. It's uh, well, you know, including 90%. Cuomo, who has you know the the most COVID nineteen of anyone you know almost in the world, and he's very very popular for how he's dealt with it. So, well, uh, I think in this case, and, and I, I think some governors have done very well. I think Christy Nome has done extraordinarily well and i jokingly uh, advocated her as the female vice presidential choice for joe biden i don't, mm -hmm. don't think she would take him up on that but uh, you know i i just remember back to the first gulf war the way back in the day 1990 91 george hw bush uh, he was riding high at about 90 percent in the polls uh, upon the successful uh, invasion and you know eviction of Saddam Hussein, at least temporarily, and uh, very quickly thereafter, he was defeated in his race for re-election as president. So uh, I think these polls tend to be uh, ephemeral and of dubious quality. Um, and I think you know if there's anything you know people running for office, uh, can take out of that it's that that's why you uh, run based and govern based on principle not on how the polls are looking at that particular moment because polls can change public opinion evolves very quickly yes and that's back to uh, yes the thing that was your biggest strength can turn into yep. your biggest weakness so now uh we've looked at something and we're alerted to something a quirk if you will in new mexico's tax code as pertains to groceries. Uh, folks who study New Mexico tax policy and even some who don't all that closely are certainly aware that under Bill Richardson, the tax, the gross receipts tax on groceries was elimin eliminated. The tax on everything else at the time was raised by half, uh, a, half a percent, significant increase in the tax on groceries. But more often than not, if you pay for pickup of groceries at a store based in New Mexico and get them delivered to a store or to a place in New Mexico, your house, uh, those groceries suddenly all become taxed. So that is fascinating. How did that happen? And, you know, uh, Richardson, what he left in 2011, I believe. So, you know, it was a different time. But the amount of uh, deliveries we have, to have that be totally differently taxed. And, you know, that's the theme of our gross receipts tax is it ought to be low, broad, and fairly applied. I think it, uh, it fails on all, all of those fronts. And this is just another example. Uh, the other thing that's interesting is because groceries aren't taxed, one of the issues that small municipalities have because they are creatures of gross receipts tax funding is their budgets are looking mighty shaky because of it because mm -hmm. they don't have a broad tax base. The only thing people were buying there for a long time was groceries. And 
I could be wrong. You know, I mean, I'm sure there is some grocery delivery in far rural New Mexico, but it's few and far between. So that means people have to come places to buy. And none of that is uh, subject to gross receipts tax. The too high gross receipts tax, but it does bring uh, just another nail in the coffin of the fact that this gross receipts tax in New Mexico needs, uh, needs reform. And that I think that maybe the uh, COVID-19, the coronavirus, I don't know if it's, uh, it's horrible and it's powerful, but it might be horrible enough and powerful enough to get uh, New Mexico to take a look at its gross receipts tax. Well, uh, and I'll explain. That could be mighty no, optimistic. No, 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 I appreciate that. <laughs> uh, that is some optimism, though. Uh, and I, uh, I want to clarify how this happened secondarily. Yeah. But the... Uh, the gross receipts tax is, is horrible. It's awful. We do not advocate for, as a standalone measure, putting taxes back on groceries. That is something that we would advocate a commensurate amount of taxation be reduced on other products. Yeah, now, yeah. And that's the w- reason I'm not so... Broaden the base. Right. Reduce the rate. Is. That's why I'm not so optimistic because yeah. in this day when we're going to be a, a dealing with a serious budget shortfall, the idea that you're going to impose taxes on groceries and limit, it, limit taxation on other things is certainly unlikely for the Democrats who control the legislature. So there, there's that. Um, I would love to see uh, an attempt at tax reform. I just don't see how they will do reform. What I see them doing is massive tax increase plus throw in a little reform there and try to put the lipstick on the pig. They did, they almost did that with HB six in 2019, but they really just put the lipstick on. They didn't even do any real reform. It was just a revenue grab. Yes. And we've talked on the podcast before and boy, I believe this will be a discussion that will be going on for months and likely years is there are not a lot of good choices for raising revenue in the current environment in New Mexico. And one of the things that I said was that, man, increasing the gross receipts tax may just be getting us into that uh, cycle of swirling around before, uh, before we go down the drain. I saw uh, in a uh, opinion piece in the Santa Fe New Mexican, there's uh, people are starting to talk about, well, maybe we ought to raise our property taxes. Mm -hmm. And I, and I, you know, raised that a few, a few weeks ago because it's one of the few areas that doesn't immediately uh, hamper economic activity and uh, raise income taxes a bunch, raise corporate income taxes. Most corporations aren't going to have profits for many years to come in New Mexico. So it's one of those things, uh, why, do they, why do we rob banks is because that's the money, where the money is. Well, what will legislators look for? They will look for where there's actually money if they uh, are looking for shortfalls, whether it be uh, state, county, or local government. Well, uh, to paraphrase the inimitable Grover Norquist, yes. uh, who uh, is a friend and been on this podcast and I, I talk to on a pretty regular basis, Taxation, metaphorically speaking, is like leeches being placed on your body, essentially sucking your lifeblood out of you as a human being. Yes. That, the human being, the metaphor of the economy, mm-hmm. the leeches being taxes. Now, uh, the best you can hope for is, say, what New Hampshire has, where they don't tax either income or sales. Mm-hmm. The government gets one bite at the apple, and it's property tax. It's a very right. heavy property tax yeah. burden, but there's a reason that New Hampshire's clung to some a uh, semblance of economic growth and sanity being even in New England. Now, New Mexico, unfortunately, does not have a limit. There, there, we have the major leeches, three leeches, if you will, all big, all fat, all growing uh, at different rates, gross receipts tax, so consumption and yeah. sales. Uh, you have the income tax, and then you have the property tax. Now, our property tax leech would be the smallest currently, so that you're, you're saying this with some... <laughs> basis in reality. And there is a argument that could be made for increasing the property tax and reducing other forms of taxation, right. both on a progressivity uh, argument, as well as uh, just a tax, you know, uh, tax collection because property taxes are a more stable form of revenue than GRT or income taxes. 
but what what you're doing is just massaging if you will those leeches and you're increasing and decreasing at various hopefully decreasing the problem is we're in a situation where the determining factor is going to be more revenue not less and that's why we at the Rio Grande Foundation are not going to talk about the grocery tax situation at this point because unless you do a swap uh, whether it's property taxes grocery taxes or any other form of taxes a swap is one thing good tax reform is one thing but at this time you're going to see a push for how can we find more revenue? How can we get more money out of the turnip, the blood from the turnip that is the New Mexico taxpayer? So that right. is a very elaborate and long-winded <laughs> way of saying, hell no, no more taxes. And that's why we've got a pledge, riograndefoundation.org slash pledge, that we believe all legislators and legislative candidates should be signing right now to say we're not going to raise taxes out of this coronavirus uh, economic situation. Yeah, and then... Uh- <gasps> The, the thing that hurts New Mexico relative to places like Texas is uh, Texas is overwhelmingly privately held. So you raise the property tax a little bit in Texas, you get a lot of money over a large percent. And not just the fact that Texas is big, but percentage-wise. In New Mexico, there's so much BLM land, Forest Service land, uh, withdrawn lands for uh, you know national labs, bases, that... There's not a lot of private property ownership. And in a lot of counties, there's virtually none. You know, the, the town or two that's there. So that even- is true. That is a true statement. <laughs> However, no, sir, you're not letting them, you're not getting New Mexico <laughs> off the hook. Uh, I am not. I'm just saying I know, I know. there is no free lunch here and no easy answer is right. the point I'm making. So even if one were, and believe me, Paul, I'm not trying to put you in the position <laughs> of advocating for raising property taxes. It yes. would go a lot easier in Texas than it would here in terms oh, of a, in true. terms of an effective solution. Right. Uh, and my only point is that uh, you see Colorado, which is heavily federally owned, and yeah. they have a much better situation when it comes to uh, tax and expenditures and diversity of economy and all the things that you want, despite Colorado having a lot of federal land. Nevada has way more federal land. Now, you can argue whether you want gambling like they have or not, but Nevada is a state that is, has an economic boom mentality. Now they are facing incredible challenges right now because even when the casinos do open up, tourism and all those kinds of things is going to be dramatically hindered. But Arizona has federal lands as well. So New Mexico, the problem here is that we have been so badly managed and so, so reliant on oil and gas for the... 90 years, the better part of our history, that you're right, there is very little else to fall back on. And it is going to be a profound and difficult change for people in Santa Fe and just the mindset of the political leaders and hopefully the citizens in terms of waking up to realize that we just can't rely on oil and gas. It's not that we want to kill oil and gas, right? because that is a very nuanced approach. It's that we need to actually diversify our economy. So let us get back to the issue of <laughs> <coughs> why grocery, uh, grocery deliveries are taxable, not just the grocery delivery, but the actual The groceries, groceries. themselves, okay. <coughs> so New Mexico, like most states, considers a grocery whatever the federal food stamp definition of groceries is. Okay. And Cigarettes? So- not a grocery. Not a grocery. Okay. Yes. Beer. Not, not a, grocery. a grocery. Bread. Yes. Okay. Hamburger. Delivery of those <laughs> groceries is not exempt from, or is oh, not considered it's... a food stamp item. So once you go into the delivery uh, side of things, you're no longer eligible for the food stamp. Uh, you know that that it's no longer covered under food stamp. So if you had it, a food stamp recipient. And they wanted to get their groceries delivered. That is not eligible. They could not use food stamps to, to get have groceries their groceries to, delivered. Interesting. So it's a piggybacking issue where we uh, rely on basically what the feds are doing. And we do that in a lot of things. Our, our yes. uh, income tax system in New Mexico, not 100%, but in the high 90s, relies on just whatever the feds now, are doing. Now, to get the scoop, you have to go to errorsofenchantment.com and, and read the story. But... Uh, there is a pilot program currently operational 
uh, under which I think 16 states, including Alabama, Iowa, Nebraska, New York, Oregon, and Washington State, but not limited to those, uh, have applied to allow delivery of groceries to be exempted under, uh, well, to allow delivery of groceries to happen with food stamps, which would then exempt those groceries from taxation. In New Mexico. In New Mexico. So, uh, yeah, just be careful out there, folks, because if you <laughs> spend, you know, and it's not unheard of for a sizable family, 500 bucks on groceries, you're talking 40 bucks, 40 bucks yeah. in taxes alone. Yeah. So it's a, a, <clears throat> a very big deal. But we are, gosh, uh, and the last thing we're going to talk about, we'll just talk about it a little bit more at some other point because we won't do it justice here because we only have a few minutes. But uh, the use of data, and uh, I listened to a podcast, you know, Wally, I'm not just a, uh, a podcaster. I am a rabid consumer of podcasts. And it was, I want to say Freakonomics. Mm -hmm. And they talked about uh, one of the two guys, uh, Levitt or Dubner, I forget which one, uh, talked about how to reform American education. And he said that something that we really need to as a nation, and this is way before coronavirus, is emphasize statistics and facility with the use of statistics. And I think that we as Americans especially, and I'm not saying we're just alone in this, people misuse statistics all the time in very bad ways that make uh, decision-making less optimal than it could be. And I think the coronavirus really has exposed that basic ignorance. For example, the United States now leads in coronavirus cases. Well, the U.S. is one of the most populous nations on the planet. We don't trust data coming out of China just as a, as a strict statement of fact. Plus, you have to have a robust and well-deployed testing regime to even know if you have large number or how many coronavirus cases you have. That is just the tip of the iceberg in terms of the way statistics often get misused and uh, slanted in ways that l mislead people, not just average folks, but politicians and the president and the whole nine yards. Without a doubt. And, you know, and an extreme example of uh, where corona is so difficult is that if you only are going to allow the sickest of the sick to get tested, your percentage of people who have COVID-19 have coronavirus is probably going to be very high. Whereas if you uh, basically, and this is an extreme example, but sometimes I believe the drive-through testing is this, you basically go to the um, hypochondriac convention and say everyone who's here can have a test. Well, very few of them may be sick. And so there's a lot of problems there. The, the, nothing encapsulates this for me more. And it's not a movie reference, but it's close. And Prairie Home Companion, oh. yeah, uh, all of our children are above average. So, you know, the way I like to say it is we have a crisis in education. 50% of our children are below average. Well, in any population, you know, that's about as good as math humor gets. That's by definition is true. And so we've seen so many issues with what these rates mean and then you know what is how reliable is the data and i could not agree with you more i mean i think that's one of the the key things is the ability to question these statistics ask the questions about how reliable are they for the decisions we're making as opposed to you know Four out of five dentists uh, recommend sugarless gum for patients who uh, chew gum, or 80% of doctors uh, choose teratin to smoke cigarettes. You know, these statistics, there's a long history in marketing and advertising, both of products and political ideas that have taken very dubious uh, quantitative methods and put them out there as being totally predictive of what the future is. And so therefore make the decision and make it my way. So well, my wife and I are watching <laughs> Mad Men right now. So the cigarette thing <laughs> yeah. especially hits home because that show pl takes place in the uh, late fifties and sixties. And uh, the idea of doctors endorsing a cigarette 
is uh, quite baffling. But <laughs> you can go to worldometers.info and they have coronavirus data for both international as well as U.S. states. And it is a, uh, you know, it is worth noting that I think the best metric of real coronavirus issues is deaths per million of population. I mean, it's a sad yes. way to think about it, but it's even, highly reliable as a statistic, except even that may not exactly. be because how do you code it a death if you get money from mm -hmm. the federal government by putting corona exactly. as the cause. So. And so that's an issue right there. So is it a garbage in, garbage out situation? And, you know, I, I it's horrible and awful to think about too, but, you know, should we also have a metric of people... 65 and up who are passing away of the virus versus people 65 or 64 and below. Uh, because, you know, if you're in a nursing home dealing with myriad health issues, you're going to face more problems. If you have an aging population, you're going to have more problems. If you have health issues inherently, obesity among others, uh, you know, in, in the treatment of the Navajo reservation, you know, these are semi sovereign bodies within the state of New Mexico. How should they be contemplated, included, disincluded in the, in the data as well? Uh, South Dakota, which, of course, uh, ha does have a large Native American population right up there with New Mexico, has 20 deaths per million population. Christy Nome, famously, mm -hmm. the governor, has kept that state relatively open. New Mexico has been relatively shut down. And the governor got praise in the New York Times. We have 59 deaths per million that's not to criticize our current governor, but I do think it is very important as we judge the response here to understand basic statistics, have solid data, and not come into it with an agenda so much as trying to just get a grasp as to what the long-term ramifications of both the health and the economic policy situations are going to be. And, of course, we've always, for the past two months, been emphasizing health. At some point, the economic decisions are going to come home to roost, so to speak. And it's, it's important to include all of this. It's very difficult, but important. Well, and then um, you have to believe that economically uh, thinking about this in terms of economic principles, in the long run, the health, and the economic factors will likely come together. You know, they call economics the dismal science for a reason. They also say in the long run, we're, we're all dead. Hopefully that's not, well, that is true. In the true long run, we are all dead. But the, the goal is, is to get through this and manage it as best we can, not only for today, but for going forward so that we don't minimize COVID-19 deaths to, uh, to date to the point that we impoverish basically our entire country for generations to come. Yeah. And those are the extremes. And we know either one of those extremes is not the answer. It's somewhere in the middle. Yeah. And there's no doubt that GDP, uh, you know, your economic output is relatively simple to measure. However, the quantifying the number of people who for some reason had negative outcomes from depression, uh, spousal abuse, all those kinds of things due to the reaction of the government to the coronavirus. Well, not being the, treated for other underlying treated, conditions, yeah. cancer treatments being delayed, you know, surgeries being delayed. There's a whole, you know, economic thinking. It's, uh, you know, it's one of those things. It's uh, the best tool that we have. It's a horrible tool, right. but it's the best tool we have because it's the most predictive in terms of, insight into what the right thing to, to do really is uh, on questions like these. So yeah. I wish it were, I wish there was, uh, you know, it's one of those, we wish there was some way that we could elect these uh, basically insightful, you know, gods from above, but that's not how it works. And uh, there's really been a few, if any examples of history where that's ever gone well. well. And that's so. why the Rio Grande Foundation advocates for, you know, so, so the, the wisdom of crowds in many ways, uh, yeah. you know, f as best as possibly fully informed citizens engaged with their own financial resources, their own time, and their own lives, making the best decisions that they can for themselves. And almost without fail, 
those kinds of decisions are superior to those of the so-called experts. As much as Dr. Fauci, as much as Dr. Uh, uh, Michelle Lujan Grisham, as much as any of these people may be knowledgeable and intellectually adept people in their given fields, uh, they are not being faced with making decisions across many different areas for individuals which they have no knowledge of uh, in terms of how they make those decisions. So we can talk for a long time on that issue. It will <laughs> rear its ugly head again because as we move through this coronavirus crisis, I think the issue of statistics and facility with statistics is going to be relevant. It's going to become an education reform issue. We're going to certainly make the point that I that New Mexico schools and I think schools in general need to focus on understanding and consuming statistics because it's so critical to our day-to-day lives. Yeah, without a doubt. <laughs> yes, this is the by far the last you've heard of that on this podcast is be my my prediction. Perhaps you bold. My youthful fascination with baseball statistics uh, had an impact on my understanding, I hope of uh, actual statistics that are relevant to our daily lives. Not that, not that batting averages aren't very important. <laughs> uh, thank you for listening to this week's podcast. Make sure to get the latest edition of Tipping Point New Mexico by subscribing at Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, and Spotify. You can post or comment on this and other episodes on Facebook and Twitter and tell Google Home to play Tipping Point New Mexico. Thanks to Path 3 Marketing for producing this show.